Welcome back to the Rising Up Fireside Chat. I'm Gautam Chikarmane, Vice President at the Observer Research Foundation. And with me is Sir Ian Blackford, Director and CEO of the Science Museum Group UK. You would be wondering what is a, a museum doing in a geopolitical conference? I was wondering too, until I realized that these institutions of the past actually contain within themselves the germinish, the germs of the future. I think museums need to be rethought in a greater geopol. I think they are great currencies of geopolitical conversations. Uh, so far, we haven't seen many of these, but uh, I just like your view on this abstract notion that museum as an institution can be part of a geopolitical conversation. Well, uh, thank you for your um, opening uh, view because I very much agree. And I think, although in a way for me it's very strange being at this event surrounded by uh, military people and politicians and um, uh, think tank people, uh, whenever I tell people I represent this major museum, people instantly understand. Um, and I think it's because what great museums offer more than anything is perspective. Because one of the things that's for me, very striking in the age of social media and 24-hour news, is there's, a, a, there's something I call the curse of now, which is every time there's a problem, um, the press reporting is hysterical, every problem seems unique in the history of humanity. And of course, the great thing about museums with a long history that they can offer is the problems repeat, that actually history tends to show that whenever there's great adversity, um, uh, innovation arrives, that there is hope. Uh, so I think the museums are a way of ins ensuring both a perspective on new problems, but also ensuring some dialogue that is calm. So how do you bridge, uh, how do you build this bridge? For instance, we have geoeconomics, so you talk about trade. We have geopolitics, so we talk about geographies, we talk about arms, uh, the defense deals, uh, ha the hard power. And yet, geopolitics subsumes soft power within it. Can museums become part of that soft power conversation? Yes. It's a very interesting problem, I think, because personally, I really hate the phrase soft power because it sounds as if it's somehow secondary. But if you think of what's being achieved at the Rosina Dialogue, you've got an enormous number of countries all talking to each other, and surely one of the greatest ways of ensuring collaboration and peace is much greater mutual understanding of each other in terms of culture. So uh, if you think of my uh, own museum, uh, our work in India is about uh, a relationship with India, which is completely different from the British history of, um, of an imperial relationship. It's about understanding modern Indian culture. And so I think that uh, museums, in a sense, are the nearest thing that still exists for neutral discussion because uh, the museums I work with all around the world are doing a rather good job at avoiding being politicized so people can meet in a forum where they feel they can have quite challenging conversations but in a safe space. So then the museum you are talking about is, again, in the past, where it's a physical geography where people can converge and have these conversations. Now, let's take that one step forward. Can we use technology and place, for instance, uh, an artifact in the middle of a conversation where there is some form of a tension? For instance, let's look at, um, let's look at UK and India. Uh, there is a whole long conversation on, un underway these days where the statues stolen from India are finding themselves in UK museums. Can we have those conversations that uh, uh, that, that sort of bridge the, the, this uh, colonial hangover uh, in front of those statues and make some statements there, uh, geocultural statements, so to speak? I, I think uh, the answer is yes, because if I can give you an example, um, in the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow, my museum had a, a very large series of digital panels uh, from uh, really across the world discussing not only the causes of climate change, but the solutions. And there were lots of people on those panels who disagreed very strongly. But actually, they were able to have a civilized dialogue and watched by thousands of people across the world. So one of the things that has been uh, a revelation for museums is that two things are true. The first is that in many ways, they're a very analog thing. They're about physical buildings and physical collections. But actually, suddenly, they have a great new dimension in the digital sphere. Uh, and it means that actually the artifacts can be shared and understood 
without geography getting in the way. And actually, with the right um, the ground rules for discussion, it is possible to have tough but honest conversations in the digital sphere. Yeah. So, uh, have you, uh, just for my information, have you done such conversations so far? Well, our main conversations have been about climate change and about uh, how, the, how um, the private sector may or may not be part of the so solutions. So, that will be more like issue-based conversations. I'm talking about inter-country uh, or the kind of conferences, uh, conversations that are happening outside this room, uh, those kind of conversations. Uh, do you think there is scope for this, like a geo-cultural event? I'm sure there is, because um, uh, uh, the point about the uh, debate about objects is that um, if you make it digital, a much larger audience can be part of it. And it's also, I think, quite important to avoid the debate about objects being completely hijacked either by politicians or academics with their own agendas. Uh, and in fact, if you have a wide uh, range of people involved, then you can have more perspectives. Uh, my museum, as it happens, doesn't particularly have collections rich in that history, but of course many museums in Britain do, and I think that actually the more there are the wide-ranging debates with a wide panel, then we'll have some productive outcomes. Okay, so let's look into the future while keeping the past in mind. Um, from my understanding, museums began with the Greeks, they were handed over to the Romans, uh, Romans turned the museums into a, a, a place, a a, 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 an enclave where their conquests, their winnings would be put up, those have carried on through the colonial era. Keeping this perspective in mind, and today it's not acceptable anymore, what do the museums of tomorrow look like? Well, the point about museums of tomorrow is that if I think of my own museum with its vast audience of young people or some of the big museums we work with internationally. So for example, I'm on the board of the Museum of Tomorrow in Rio. Um, we're now talking to um, a wonderful new uh, science museum in Dubai. And I think what's very striking about young people is that they're not really that interested in the things we've just been discussing, which is the colonial debate, because they're much more interested in how museums can be part of achieving diversity. So let me give an example of what I mean. Uh, when we are devising exhibitions about uh, future technology projects, one of the big things we try and achieve is, for example, raising the profile of women in science. And overwhelmingly, what young people say to us is, look, we don't want to spend our entire lives talking about 18th and 19th century history. We want to talk about how young people, particularly with a diverse perspective, can be part of future exhibition plans. And I would say that is probably the biggest priority for most museums for the next 10 years. So uh, the museums of the past collected a certain kind of artifacts. What are you collecting today that will be of relevance 100 years later? Well, uh, what we're collecting is, um, uh, and by the way, first of all, one of the challenges for museums is that collecting has become complicated because, of course, a lot of great art and a lot of new technology is digital. So in the old days, it was very easy to collect a sculpture or a painting or some gold crown, um, whereas now a lot of stuff is actually in the digital sphere. So that's a challenge, by the way, although we're, we're addressing that. Um, but in, in a way, um, I suppose the biggest thing, especially for my museum, is trying to avoid what I call the single hero narrative. So if you look at the future of science, so much of what is being achieved is teamwork. Now, the tradition of museums is you have great heroes and heroines. It's about the individual genius. That is still true, but it's not as true as it used to be. And more and more, we want uh, to tell stories about collaborations. So I think the biggest thing we collect now, which is more important than the objects, is the story of people, in the people involved either in art or in science, because that increasingly is what the audience wants to hear, not just worshipping individual objects. So, uh I would need a little elaboration. Y you are saying that the rock stars of science are no longer required. We are looking at collaboration. So are you moving from science to technology? For instance, uh, an iPhone or a, uh, or a 5G equipment has more than 100 uh, inventors from across the world having conversations to deliver a particular kind of technology. Is that the kind of uh, uh, thing you're talking, talking let about? Let me give an example. So um, in my own 
uh, museum, and it's true of many science museums around the world, um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of only talking about people who won the Nobel Prize. But uh, if you look at the skills that the world needs going into the future, and let's take green technology, for example. Think about solar power or wind turbines, which are going to be vital to our future. We need uh, a whole range of skills, not just um, brilliant physicists and chemists, but also technicians. And some of these jobs may not be very high profile, but actually they're going to be vital to keeping all this infrastructure working. So we're changing the type of stories we collect to tell the s stories of people who are doing what I would describe as in a way, sort of middle-ranking jobs in the future of science. Uh, and in the same way that um, with artificial intelligence and robotics, actually there's a whole army of young people from diverse backgrounds involved in that technology. It's not just what I call the story of eureka moments. Okay, so suppose you were to uh, uh, set up an event, a, a geocultural event, uh, I would add politicians to that conversation as well because finally after science and technology has done its bit, it's, um, uh, it's the social sciences and the political power uh, that puts things together, uh, let us say, in terms of uh, Millennium Development Goals or, or, or climate change, for instance. But suppose you were to set up a, um, uh, you were to organize a conference, a geocultural conference today. What would your, uh, what would the, what, how would you headline it? I, um, I would headline it in the spirit that I've taken from this dialogue. So, what I mean by that is what's very, very striking being in India is when uh, people in India talk about climate change and the challenges, instead of what we get in Europe, which is a lot of doom-mongering and despair about the issue, you get the kind of Indian spirit, which is actually, let's innovate, these are opportunities. And I think in that spirit, I would want a conference bringing together the scientists, and I agree with you about the politicians, which is looking at how the challenges of the next, year, next few years can actually be exciting rather than depressing. And also, you said something very interesting about uh, social science, because uh, my own museum, and I think increasingly this is true of all museums, realize that uh, social science has a great deal to offer museums in terms of persuasion, because just inventing a technology does not mean that it will be adopted. If you look at the way the world has reacted to COVID, the reaction of countries has been very, very different. So if you think of my country in India, by and large, we've uh, celebrated the scientific achievements and adopted the vaccine. But if you look at, for example, America, the issue has been highly contentious. And what that tells you is just knowing the science is not enough. You need to understand the narrative. And that's where, of course, politicians are so important. And that's where the danger also lies, because a narrative can be captured by, let's say, by ideology, by power by uh, a system of governance. For instance, if China were to uh, create such a museum, the language, the grammar of that museum or that conference would be very different from, say, what India would do. So uh, how do you prevent that hijack from happening? Well, the interesting thing is that, um, although you think that might be true, uh, we um, are doing a lot of work at the moment with uh, five major uh, science museums in China that are long-term partners, and actually, if I can use um, a cricketing phrase, um, they're playing a straight bat. So in fact, they are not trying to uh, present the story of the vaccine hunt in a propagandist way, because actually they realize that uh, in the long term, it's better to tell a straight story. And in fact, one of the things we say to all our international partners is that um, we are only going to work with people if we're doing some objective storytelling. Um, but, but also, sometimes, uh, you know, we're quite brave. So we have done a lot of work about some of the scientific challenges in Brazil, for example. We did a major exhibition recently about the future of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, I think it's not uh, too controversial to say but I may not be the most popular person with the president of Brazil for doing that. But actually, I think we earned a lot of respect from the scientific community in Brazil, and also we raised their morale by pushing back on some of the political narratives. Last question, uh, and it's, it's an open, uh, it's your last word. Uh, what would you tell a 10-year-old student uh, to come, why should he come to your museum? Or why should he even consider museum when he has everything he needs or she needs on, on her screen? Well, I'm very amused by that question because when uh, my museum was shut during COVID, I was swamped by letters 
old-fashioned handwritten letters by young children telling me how much they miss the museum. Uh, and I think what that tells you is, although we live in an age where uh, uh, the internet and gaming, actually, overwhelmingly, young people still long for museum experiences because um, they're vivid, real-life experiences. And uh, what I would say to the 10-year-old child is there is no substitute for the real object. And, and I see every day of my life those 10-year-old children staring at some of the great inventions in the history of the Industrial Revolution, and they absolutely love them because they can see how they work and they can understand their impact on society. And even if you have the best digital technology in the world, there's nothing like the real thing. Sir Ian Blackford, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.